Hi everyone. In this video, I'll show you how I fine-tune the OpenAI's Whisper model on my family's dialect of Chinese. So Whisper is a fairly popular model nowadays for ASR or speech recognition, and it is multilingual, so it can recognize around 100 different languages. But one language that I cannot understand is my family's dialect of Chinese. Well, which dialect? The name of this dialect is called Diaoju or Caozhouhua. Diaoju is part of the Minnan language family and is spoken in eastern Guangdong province. Let's go over some basic facts about the Diaoju language. First, it has about 10 million speakers, which is about the same as Swedish or Greek. But unlike these two languages, Diaoju is not associated with any nation state, so it is much less widely known. It is part of the Minnan language family. And in this map, this region here is the Diaoju language. The closest other language to Diaoju is Hokkien, which is spoken in southern Fujian and in Taiwan. But these two languages are only slightly mutually intelligible. And here we have a family tree of all the Chinese languages. Uh, so Diaoju is over here, and it is most closely related to Hokkien. It is also more distantly related to Mandarin and Cantonese, which are probably the two most well-known varieties of Chinese, but kind of distantly related because Mandarin is all the way here, this group of languages, and Cantonese is here. So it is not mutually intelligible with either Mandarin or Cantonese. And many linguists consider that Diaoju is one of, if not the most, conservative dialect or variety of all the Chinese languages. Now our goal is to do transfer learning from Mandarin Chinese to Diaoju, because Mandarin is a high resource language with about 1 billion speakers, so a hundred times more people speak Mandarin than Diaoju. It is also a language that Whisper already can recognize pretty well. So let's examine linguistically, does it make sense to do transfer learning from Mandarin to Diaoju? Now this is not supposed to be a linguistics video, so I'm only going to go over at a very high level the linguistic similarities and differences between these two languages. First, the syntax and word order is similar. Both of these languages are isolating and analytic, with very little morphology. They have the SVO word order. And there are some differences in how you uh, construct negation sentences or ask questions in Diaoju. But in many cases, the word order for two sentences are going to be identical in these two languages. The phonology is quite different though. Diaoju has about eight tones and extensive tone sandy, meaning that the tones can change a lot depending on the context and it has Czech syllables which do not exist in Mandarin. The vocabulary is also quite different, and I think this part is going to be the most challenging. I've read some linguistics reports that Diaoju and Mandarin have about 50% lexical similarity, so about half the words in Diaoju will have an equivalent word in Mandarin Chinese. But overall I'd say these two languages are quite different but similar enough that knowing one would definitely help you with learning the other, whether you are a human or an AI. Another interesting thing about this language is it's a primarily spoken language and not a written one. So here's a funny Twitter post about all the ways you can write this phrase Inang ai jia mi gai. And native speakers do occasionally write it and when they do they opt for something like this using Chinese characters. But the difficulty is there's no standardized form of doing so, so different speakers might write the same words using different Chinese characters. This is usually not a problem because whenever people need to write something, they write it in standard Chinese. Because basically everybody who speaks Diaoju also speaks Mandarin Chinese and they use that whenever they need to write. And this situation is not exactly unique to Diaoju. It's basically the case for most Chinese dialects, except for Mandarin and maybe Cantonese. This presents a challenge for us because for Whisper, if there is no writing system, then what do we output? And I decided to design the system to take Diaoju's speech as input and output Mandarin Chinese. So technically Whisper here is doing speech translation and not automatic speech recognition. As you probably expect, Diaoju is a low resource language, but actually it's really low resource because I looked at a bunch of multilingual speech datasets, and not one of them contained Diaoju, even the CMU Wilderness dataset, which contains 700 languages, but does not contain Diaoju. 
Since there is no open source and readily available dataset for this language, we're going to have to build a data pipeline to get this data completely from scratch. Fortunately, what we do have is a bunch of old movies and TV shows from YouTube and Billy Billy. As you can probably tell, these are really old. A lot of them are made in the 70s and 80s, and they're around 360 or 480p. But they do actually have subtitles that are pretty high quality, and these subtitles are usually in Mandarin Chinese. But what's annoying is they are all hard-coded onto the video and not in any kind of like subtitle format, so we have to run optical character recognition to extract text from them. But this is good enough, so we went onto YouTube and Billy Billy and manually found about 120 videos, and by manual inspection, check which ones have uh, Deoju speech and are subtitled in Mandarin Chinese. Because even though most of them use Mandarin subtitles, a small proportion of them have Deoju language subtitles, which we don't use. And downloading all of these videos gives around 60 hours of video data. Now we have the data, so the first step is to run optical character recognition, or OCR. We do this frame by frame, and the subtitles is in a fairly consistent position all the time, in the bottom third, so to save some resources, we can crop to the bottom one third of the image, and then run the OCR. I tried a number of OCR models, including Tesseract, Easy OCR, and Paddle OCR, and I found that Tesseract did not work well for these sort of images, because it expects a white background, and does not work when the background is colorful like this. And out of the three, I found that Paddle OCR works the best probably because it's made by Baidu, which is a Chinese company. And when you run it, you get something like this from the OCR system. So a bunch of bounding boxes and uh, the characters for each bounding box, as well as a confidence level. And all of them we can just concatenate to get the subtitles for this frame of video. The next step is to group um, chunks of similar subtitles of consecutive frames into segments, where it's that's saying the same thing from a beginning duration to an end duration. So for example, here these frames are uh, segment number one, here's segment number two, and these ones are second, segment number three. And even though it's pretty high quality, um, there are sometimes like OCR errors, like this character here is recognized as the incorrect one. So we have to use some heuristics to fix this. And I used um, a heuristic based on Levenstein distance to decide when is it an OCR error versus when is it the subtitle actually becoming a different segment. And some other heuristics like looking at the confidence score and looking at if the number of characters is too short given the length of the speech and stuff like that. And this process produces a bunch of rows where you have the text and then the beginning and end time for each text. So our pipeline looks something like this. We start with the videos, and the first step is doing the OCR on the frames. After that, we do the second step, which is grouping them into segments. And the third step is we clip the audio from the video, and we can discard all the video data, and use the segment data to clip the audio into MP3 files. And during this step, we can also do some more filtering and deduplicate, because we found that when we randomly find 120 videos, there is actually a fair amount of duplicates where um, part of one video is part of a TV show that is contained in another video. And finally, we randomize everything and do a train test split, and take 90% of the data for training and 10% for the validation dataset. And after all of this, we get about 35,000 subtitle segments, and in total this is about 35 hours of speech data. And most of the segments are between 3 and 5 seconds, so they are fairly short segments of speech. That's it for the data pipeline, so now let's talk about the Whisper model. Um, and Whisper is a fairly standard encoder-decoder transformer architecture, with one difference being that while most transformers have uh, text as input, Whisper has audio as input. And the format of the audio is pretty simple, it is always 30 seconds. If it's shorter than 30 seconds, it's padded to 30 seconds. And they do some standard speech signal processing. So they do um, 80 channels of log mail spectrogram, 
and with a 10 second 10 millisecond stride meaning that the input to whisper is always a tensor of dimension 80 by 3000 and all of this goes through a bunch of transformer encoder blocks and then a um, bunch of transformer decoder blocks with cross attention and usually we use beam search to perform the decoding and um, all of this is pretty standard if you've seen transformers before whisper supports about 100 different languages and is pre-trained on 680,000 hours of data. It also comes in five different sizes. So in this video, we will be focusing on the larger three, the small, medium, and large models. Relative to some of the large language models that we see nowadays, even the large Whisper model is not that big in the sense that it's about 1.5 billion parameters, which can easily fit on one GPU. A really interesting thing about the Whisper architecture is the multitask training format. Each of these boxes here is basically a token. The blue ones are the actual data tokens and the orange ones are the control tokens. I'm gonna ignore everything before in this part before the start token. So we begin with the start of transcript token here. And the first control token is the language token. And this is useful for when you have an audio clip, you're not sure which language it is, and then you can feed it through uh, the Whisper model and then see which token comes up, and that's the language identification token. And after that, it can do two tasks. It can either transcribe to the same language or it can translate it to English. And we don't care about English in this model, so let's just assume we will transcribe. There is an option to output the timestamps as well as the output, um, but we're going to turn that off. So we have to put the no timestamps control token. And after all of that, we get to output the actual text tokens. And about the language token, um, we don't have a language token for the Diaju language, and there's no way to add one. So we're going to just use the Chinese language token. And during both the training and decoding, we will force the model to go down this path here, basically prepend these four control tokens before we generate the text. Now it's time to actually train the model. So it's actually not that difficult to fine tune a Whisper model because Hugging Phase actually ran this event a while ago. It was a community event where they got a bunch of people to fine tune Whisper on a bunch of different languages. They have a GitHub repo set up with all the scripts and instructions on how you can fine tune Whisper on your own dataset. So if you go down here, um, they have some instructions. Introduction, what is Whisper? Uh, here they have uh, some credits on uh, launching a GPU on Lambda Cloud. Uh, this is no longer available because the event is over. And here they have instructions on how to set up the environment, such as the Unix libraries, the Python libraries, CUDA, and the instructions on how to get the data, which they use mostly common voice, and how to set up the data loaders, all of that stuff. What I found most useful as a starting point was this script here, Run Speech Recognition Streaming. And what this is, is basically a single script that you can run to fine tune Whisper end to end. It has a bunch of configuration of the models you want to load and the data that you want to use. And it does everything that you might want to do when fine-tuning a model, including loading the data, doing pre-processing, the training loop, and it running the eval metric. So this is a really good starting point if you're trying to fine-tune Whisper on your own dataset. One thing that I decided to refactor was all this code here that dealt with loading a dataset because it used the Hugging Face datasets library, which I felt was a little bit more complicated than it needs to be. So I replaced it with my own data loader that can just read my own file structure and feed it into the PyTorch model. One more thing that's kind of useful is the recommended training configurations. So the point of this is the training, like the, especially the batch size, is really dependent on how much GPU memory you have. In my case, I have a GPU set up in my apartment, but it is fairly small with only 12 gigabytes of video memory. Hugging Face recommends that if you have a GPU of 16 gigabytes memory, then these are the batch size and gradient accumulation parameters that you should use for training and for evaluation, and for different model sizes, like small and medium. 
The advantages of a bigger GPU is you can fit a much larger batch size. For example, if you have an A100, which has 40 gigabytes of memory, then you can train with 32 um, batch size and not have to do gradient accumulation. Whereas if you only have 16 gigabytes of GPU, then you have to do a whole bunch of gradient accumulation to train a medium model. And actually I found that even with a 12 gigabyte GPU, I was able to train the medium model without too much problem using the 8-bit Atom optimizer. So this is a quantized version of the Atom optimizer that comes with the bits and bytes library and is significantly more memory efficient than the default Atom optimizer. So you can train much larger models with larger batch sizes than you would be otherwise with a fairly small GPU. And there is a slight decrease in accuracy, but it is not too noticeable. There is also the Ada factor optimizer, but um, it works differently from the Atom optimizer and they do not recommend using this. Over here, I have a TensorBoard uh, visualization for one of my training runs. In this case, it is a small model. On this chart here, we can see how long did it take to train per epoch. And I found that we need around 10 epochs of fine tuning, which takes around 20 hours on my GPU. And this is for the small model, which is around 240 million parameters. And if you want to do the medium model, it's about double the parameter count. So it will take twice as long per epoch. Um, which would take around two days on my GPU. And for the large model, which is 1.5 billion parameters, that's another doubling, so twice as big as the medium model and four times as big as the small model. So that would take another doubling of the amount of time and compute per epoch. And this chart here shows the learning rate schedule. So if we zoom in, um, it starts very low and it goes up to some amount like uh, 1e negative 5 and then it slowly decreases as um, the training run progresses. And you can tune the learning rate and schedule parameters if you like, but usually these things are pretty stable. Like um, you don't have to tune them too much to get the model working. And here's the training loss curve. So um, what's happening is uh, the first epoch, it uh, training loss goes down really rapidly. And then each of these steps you can see is another epoch. Like every time we go through an epoch, it goes through the entire training data once. And since it's already seen the training data a few times, the loss goes down rapidly every time you see the training data another time. But if you train it for too long, then the training loss goes to nearly zero, which is probably not good. It means it's overfitting to the training data. So I think it's best to stop the training run before it gets to that point, like around here, around eight to 10 epochs, so that it doesn't overfit. I also built this tool in Streamlit to basically debug the data pipeline and visualize what kind of things the model is learning and what it's struggling at learning. Uh, this is run on all of the test set, um, around 3,500 samples. And here we have a histogram of the uh, word error rate of all of the samples. And overall, the test set is quite challenging. And you can see there's a lot of samples where the word error rate is quite high because many times the speech is not very clear or this background music, or it is just being spoken very quickly. I will later show you how I construct a different evaluation set, which is more representative of how people actually speak and um, not how people speak in these movies. I also made a search box to um, see how and whether it learned a certain word. For example, I wanna see if it learned the word fumu or parents. And this tool says there's three samples of this word among the test set. And if we just go take a random one. Um, the true text is here. And this is the model output. It's pretty close. It got a few words wrong, but it picked up the word fumu, which is bebo. So I found Streamlit really helpful for debugging any issues with the data pipeline and just visualizing, like, how do you even say this word in Diaoju? We don't want to evaluate on the TV shows and movies because it's not really how people talk. So I built uh, two different evaluation sets that are more representative. The first condition is careful speech. So for this condition, I set up my podcasting recording setup and got my wife to read a bunch of phrases in Diaoju. And this is spoken very slowly and clearly for maximum clarity. So it should be the ideal setup for getting a good score. 
The second condition is a conversational speech setup. So we just recorded some of our conversations on WeChat with family members. And then we used a tool called SIL SAML, which is a linguistic tool for data annotation um, to annotate a bunch of these phrases into Mandarin Chinese. And this is just how people talk normally without a special effort of speaking slowly and clearly. So it's a more realistic but more difficult setting. And we evaluate the word error rate with the model's output against the ground truth. And since Chinese doesn't put spaces in between the words, which you normally need for evaluating WER, uh, we just consider each character as its own word. Here are the results. Uh, first, I wanted to see how does the Whisper model do by itself. So I just ran the untrained Whisper Media model, uh, which is trained on a lot of Mandarin data and I think some amount of Cantonese data as well. And as we expect, the results are not very good. Um, it doesn't understand a lot of DLGU because it has not seen the language before at all. Although I'm kind of impressed by 0.83, meaning that it can understand 17% of DLGU just by learning from Mandarin and Cantonese. Here's what happens when we train on 35 hours of DLGU data. And we have the Whisper Small and Whisper Medium model. The Whisper Medium model does about 10% better than the Whisper Small model, uh, which makes sense because it's a bigger model. And in the careful speech case, it gets a error rate of 0.31. So um, we can basically understand almost 70% of what is being said. And finally, I tried the Whisper Large V3 model, which is trained on even more data than the original Whisper model and adds more Cantonese data, especially. I thought it would be really helpful to double the model size and add more pre-training data, but it only improved the model a little bit. So it is quite a lot more difficult to recognize conversational speech that is being spoken at a normal pace with people cutting off each other, um, and quite a lot easier when the speech is careful and slowly and um, carefully pronounced. And for the Whisper Large model, it is too big to train on my home GPU setup, so I had to go to the cloud and rent a bigger GPU for a day or so, and that cost about $20. This graph here from the Whisper paper um, on the left-hand side is a useful um, graph for comparing how we're doing compared to other languages in Whisper. So what this graph basically shows is how does the word error rate on the y-axis compare as you add the very number of hours of audio that you're training on. And you can see there's a quite a strong correlation between um, how much data you're training on and how good the model is. So when you're adding uh, 1,000, 10,000, 100,000 hours, then the word error rate goes down and down. And in our case, we have um, 30 hours of audio, so we're somewhere around here. And if you read off the graph, um, you expect to get somewhere around 20, 30 word error rate, which is around what we're getting. Remember that we're getting 30 word error rate in our careful speech setup. And the setup here is fairly comparable as well because they're evaluating on the Flores dataset, which is also a corpus of careful and read speech. So this basically confirms to me that we're not doing anything wrong. This is about the error rate that you expect to get given the amount of training data you have. And if you want to improve the error rate more, then you just need to add more data to the model. Now, how about some qualitative evaluation? So which words are easy for the model and which words are hard? I found that the words that are the easiest for the model to learn are ones that have a cognate in Mandarin or they're really high frequency. For example, the first three here are fairly straightforward. Donggo, which is Zhongguo, uh, Pengyu, which is Pengyu, and Kaixin, which is Kaixin in Mandarin. The fourth example, Yinang, is different from Mandarin Tamen, but it is so common that it's also pretty easy to learn. The difficult cases that the model frequently gets wrong is when the words are just different from Mandarin and not that common, um, and it, especially if the number of syllables is different. Um, here are some three random examples. Xiaoda, which means yi wei, and uh, gao wei, uh, Mandarin you say nan so, and nang e, which means you si hou. Another thing that I noticed is longer clips tend to get cut off, and this is sort of expected due to the training data being quite short most of the time, 
So if you say something longer than five seconds, um, the model learns to ignore the rest because it's only trained to expect data of that shorter length. I'd like to finish off with a quick and fun demo. So this fine-tuning whisper blog post from Hugging Face, at the end of it, it gives a script in Gradio that um, spins up a demo. So here's the script. It's about 10 lines of code, and it lets you, even without any front-end knowledge, to build a nice-looking UI that you can play with the model. I'm going to get my wife, who is a native DLG speaker, to try some sentences with the model, and let's see how it does. In English, this sentence means when we traveled to Chongqing, we ate a lot of spicy food. And the model did pretty well, actually. I was surprised at how well it did on this example. It got the word Dengking, Chongqing, um, which I checked was definitely not in the training data. And I also got the word Wang, um, woman, even though it's uh, one character being mapped to two Mandarin characters. The only mistake that I made was the word kiam, which means spicy. And the model output was um, which means we ate a lot of salty food. And actually the word here is pronounced kiam in Diaoju, which is quite similar to kiam, so that could be the source of the confusion. Let's try another example sentence. In English, this means today there was so much traffic due to the snow, it took over an hour to get to school. And we live in Vancouver, so this happens quite often that there is a bunch of snow and everything stops working. And the model really struggled with this sentence compared to the last one. Um, but up to about this point of the sentence, it did pretty well. It outputted the wrong word for Saito, but it got everything else. But it failed to translate this phrase, Diam Gua Zing, which means over an hour. Um, because in Mandarin, um, you will say this phrase, uh, which is five characters. In Mandarin, you will say Yiga Doi Hao Si. And instead, the model predicted three characters that sounded kind of like um, these three DLG words, but does not make sense in Mandarin Chinese. And there's a similar situation here with the phrase bo gao ha kao. And I think here the grammar is kind of tricky because the DLG word bo um, sometimes translates to bu or mei or meiyou, depending on the context. So the model predicted the wrong one and got confused. Anyways, that's all I have for this video and thanks for watching if you made it this far. Let me know in the comments if you like this video or if you want to play with the model, I'm planning to make it open source eventually. Um, and please hit that like button, um, subscribe to my channel, and ring the bell icon to get not notified when I post new machine learning videos. Goodbye!